What's up, everybody? Back with another episode of the podcast. Still don't really have a name for it, but I have a great guest today who is a very prolific data analyst. His name is Ominous. He works for Bleed Esports over in Singapore, and he's been somebody that I've interacted with a bunch on Twitter before, just kind of talking about statistics and Valorant and how to kind of visualize the data and actually break down performance for both players and teams. So I was really excited to have him on because he's working directly with players using his skills in computer science and data visualization to help the team improve. So let's go ahead and get into the conversation. And as always, let me know what you think in the comments below. What's up, everybody? And welcome to the second episode of this podcast. Uh, I've got a super cool guest today. This is Ominous, who is the current... Um, data analyst for bleed esports over in singapore uh, you might know him from uh, vlr or from his various posts on twitter about stats and data visualization uh, very very interesting stuff uh, i reached out to him because we we got talking on twitter about a variety of different sort of data topics and you know getting super nerdy about like who's actually good at the game so hopefully uh, we could talk today a bit about that and also how to use data to help players improve since that's what you're doing over at bleed right now so how are you doing today man uh it's it's, it's a lovely evening today like uh, pr it's pretty it's it's been raining here all day so i mean the podcast is the thing that keeps me going <laughs> perfect well happy to provide you with some motivation uh so let me start you off with a question that i ask everybody that i talk to which is what do you think the ultimate goal of a coach is um, just in general and you can also extend that to like an analyst it doesn't have to be okay. Specifically. So, like, uh, I watch a lot of football, and like one of my favorite coaches is like Jose Mourinho, and he he was asked this question in an interview once, and he said that I'm not here to teach people how to play football, uh, like individually, I'm here to teach them how to win as a team. So that that's the, that should be the ultimate goal of a coach: how to make them win as a team and how to you know improve like uh, every player individually. Okay. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. Um, let me ask you, you have a background in football. Like, did you come to esports because you were interested in traditional sports? Is that sort of like the pipeline for you or what? Yeah, I mean, I've been like watching a lot of football and I, I, I did computer science and I did intern under a tier, tier three club in the UK for like scouting purposes and data stuff. It was, it was, I was an intern for like one month. And yeah, that's how I like, I mean, esports was always there. I've been playing like CS from the past 10 years, like as a hobby and like just in general casually. And when Valorant came out, I thought, you know, people could use like, there's like good use of data and Valorant as well. So I moved on to Valorant. Awesome. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. There's a, there's a lot of good data to talk about. So hopefully we can get into some of that. Um, I guess the, the first thing that I want to ask you is, like how do you sort of use your data to to actually help a team because i feel like there's and we've kind of had this evolution of data in valorant already in the first couple of years where at first it was just like vanity metrics right it's like oh acs and yeah, yeah people get lots of kills but now we're kind of getting a little bit more granular with we understand that to actually sort of get like a good picture of how well somebody's performing you have to incorporate things like what role are they playing what agent are they playing what map are they on that kind of stuff so have you been able to actually use data to like legitimately help a team as opposed to just kind of being like, here's some numbers, you know? Okay, so there's like two things. Uh, the first one is probably like stats that are just for players, you know, like X, X player had like 20 kills. He had like 300 ACS, so he's a good, he's a good player or a bad player or like different kind of metrics. But uh, these are like individual stats that don't really tell much. But if if you're like looking to improve as a team, how I go about it is like basically we have like certain benchmarks. Now, now obviously Valorant is like it's it's like the VCT itself is like in its second year now, so we have a lot of data actually already available. So, like just like in trad traditional sports, like after a while, you know, you start making averages. Like in baseball, for example, you have averages like expected above averages. So we have like certain benchmarks. Uh, for for certain like okay, like for a team, uh, let's say like post. Uh, one of the most important things I would tell you like is like an example would be like post plant win rates. Mm -hmm. So we have like uh, certain expected averages based on previous two years data that the team should be hitting or should be above average usually. So you can call yourself a, a team that wins post plants usually. 
and then uh, we like divide the data or like you know get more deeper into it by like dividing it by like how many players are alive you know xvx conditions like 3v3 4v4 what agents are they playing and you know uh, th that's where you generate like heat maps and all that so all these like uh, help you help the players make better decision decisions basically okay so you kind of use it as a way to like pinpoint where issues or strengths might arise in a team so like... yeah uh, yeah yeah basically i did this like interview like three months ago and he he asked me a similar question and i told him the the analyst's job is to basically find problems and the coach finds the solutions mm, okay um that makes sense so let's say for example that you're you're looking at post plant data just use that as an example and you see that your team is um like around the benchmark so you, you're you're basically like where you sh you should be, uh, mm -hmm. but you're noticing that I guess w where do you go from there? Like, would you still kind of dig into that and be like, well, how do we improve maybe in like five v three situations? Can you can you get like that deep into sort of yeah, yeah, using the can, data? Uh, yeah, you can you can get uh, like any kind of XVX situations for post plans or just in general. So like j just recently, I can tell you is like we scrim a lot and like i always felt that you know whenever we're in like in a 5v4 situation we like we throw like a lot of advantages and like I, that was just a general eye test but when i just checked the data like recently like today i found that we're actually better than many of the vct teams like drx or loud and all that when it, when it comes to like 5v4 conversions so you know it's not always what the eye tells you like data might tell you something very different as well interesting okay yeah that makes sense because i i feel like especially if you're just like watching a game you can kind of be hypercritical of every single little mistake that you see but i guess having that data is nice because you can lean on it and be like well actually maybe some of the things that we're doing that seem like we're throwing are actually getting us these advantages and, and winning us the post plants as well yeah. right Cool. Yeah. The uh, the uh, the other important thing that I I usually do, like especially because these days we're in the off season, we keep scrimming, is that you you need to like track or compile your data. Like maybe day to day basis is a bit too much, but at least weekly basis to actually check improvement, mm -hmm. how far you're going up or you're going down. So that is also very important. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense because it, it's almost like a I I guess it's kind of like a stock market graph to some extent. Yeah. Where, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Do you have any favorite stats that you that you like particularly like to look at for analyzing how the team's doing? Uh, for for Duelists, like one of my favorite stats to look at is like opening kill attempts. I, for some reason, I like that stat because it, like even in CS, it's a very nice stat to look at. Uh, so I like looking at, you know, uh, one of my favorite stats actually is opening kill attempts divided by first kills. Okay. So it, it's a very good measure for a good Duelist if you're like high up there. It's basically like your conversion rate of, of yeah, yeah. opening the, yeah. the round with an advantage yeah. for your team. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, what about for like team-wide metrics? What um, what do you think is like maybe some of the most important stuff to look at? For team-wise metrics, it, it depends because there are like multiple situations. Like There's basically like five different players playing different roles, different maps. So uh, whenever, like, there's no particular stat, but whenever I look at stats for a team, I make sure I look at it map-wise, like all the all the maps in our map pool, so we can actually find out, you know, the maps where we're, we're, like, excelling or maps we're actually lacking. So there's no particular stat as a team, but I do like to, like, look at all our maps, like, based on map-wise, you know? Okay. So let me ask you, and if any of this is, like, secret you know formula stuff that you can't give away just feel free to like let me know obviously i don't want you to lose your job um but let's say that you're trying to you you look at your stats you see that you're really bad at a particular map let's just give an example of like icebox for example um so you're bad at icebox and you just see that your your win rate is bad and it, maybe it's bad on like defense compared to the average or something like that where do you go from there? Like, where do you start attacking the problem? Um, if you just know that you're generally bad at a specific map, but you don't have like, yeah, I guess like, okay. how, how do you dig into like where the problem actually is? Okay. Yeah. Just like I said, so first problem was like, we look at it map wise. Now, if I, if I know that there's something wrong with the particular map, I look at multiple metrics from the same map. Like if you, being at bad at one map doesn't mean that you're bad at everything. Mm -hmm. There must be something good you're doing as well. 
So I look at like for, for the next thing I do like after I look at a map is like I divide it by attack and defense. Then on a de like let's say on defense, then I look at like post plant win rates. Then I look at you know opening kills on defense conversions. Then I look at our anchor players who particularly play a site. Uh, maybe there's something wrong in a particular bomb site. You know we, we give that site too easily. Maybe we're not able to retake one particular site. So I go on like basically you just keep dividing the problems one by one and you you find the particular problems where you actually have problems. Okay. That makes sense. And um, I guess <laughs> this might be a, sort of a dumb question, yeah. but like how uh, how successful do you think you are in finding these problems? Like how long does this take you to actually kind of like get down to something that's concrete that you can start working on as a team? It usually takes like a day because uh, after every week or usually after a day of scrim, like if we have like a bad scrim, I usually talk to the coach or the coach talks to me. So we we basically know like, particular map we have problems on and then i just like spend like four five hours looking at different stats for our particular stats and different even our beauties so one important thing that like is like you you look at the stats then you also look at the wards you know just to like double check what the stats are actually saying and uh, yeah that's how you get to the problem about the time frame it takes me like two three hours to actually like look because all of them all of these different metrics that i look at have like set averages right like one of the like most of our benchmarks like I'll be very honest, <laughs> like the best team in this region is for me is DRX at like multiple things. Mm -hmm. So most of my benchmarks are like based on DRX and a few other teams. So if we are hitting those benchmarks, we're pretty fucking good at it. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, and also, I guess <laughs> being able to watch the VODs probably makes it a little bit less monotonous yeah. than just staring at numbers all the whole yeah. time too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, okay, so it, once you have sort of like pinpointed on certain things, what's sort of your um your way of like bringing stuff to a coach because obviously you have a head coach on the team yeah. um do you have assistant coaches as well yeah yeah we have one okay so you have like a specific data point um that's that needs attention then you have to actually interface with the coach who's then going to bring that to the team so what's that sort of process like how is, how is working with uh the head coach um so so like is like he has like 10 years of CS, so he's like very, very experienced and he's a very fun person to talk to. So uh, I, honestly, I'd, I'll say it's not that hard, but like Valorant aside, uh, like for example, I'll tell you like I have I have a research paper on COVID vaccines, like even before vaccines came out. But my my whole focus on I was a computer science student. So data science is such a thing that you can apply to like multiple domains in life, like, you know, uh, medical field or like let's say football scouting and all that the the important part comes in each of these is like you need to have a background research for everything mm -hmm. and the and the most important thing they're gonna they're gonna tell you is like is communication how you communicate like be it any field where where you're using data science communication is like key so i w i have to like tell the data or like the problems or the numbers in such a way that the coach is able to understand the exact problems and we can figure out the answer that way then so I have to be like very uh, precise with my uh, data and whatever I'm presenting to the coach. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, have you ever gotten to uh, a spot where the coach thinks something differently than the data is presenting and you have to kind of like convince them using the data? Like, l listen, I, I understand that you think that this is how things are supposed to go, but here's what the numbers are saying. And how do you approach that? I mean, like map specifically, no. But there's there there are other things that I do which is related to like comps, so like non mirror win rates and win rates basically which agent is good on a map. So um, we we like have like certain like uh, you know conversations about like is this agent actually good but the data says something else. But then uh, I'll tell you that he's he's very open about it. You know even if he thinks it's not good he do, he is willing to like try them out in scrims and just see how good he that particular agent is on that map. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Um, uh, I want to change, uh, gears a little bit here and get away from just pure data stuff for a minute. Um, how do you think the, the numbers actually like help build, um, like trust between the staff and the players? I would assume that having like actual kind of hard data makes it maybe a little bit more easy to like give feedback or would you would you agree with that yeah yeah i mean i agree like generally at least like from my experience players are like quite open about it like i have my own specific job and then um 
I give feedback to the players if they're doing something wrong, like particularly like here we are talking about individual stats, okay? Like it could be like uh, their positioning, like anchor time, like uh, where they anchor on the side, or maybe it's the duelist, his opening kill, he's not taking enough opening duels or something. So I, I talk to him, I talk to the coach, and the coach talks to him. So like, at least from my experience, the players over here are like very willing to learn openly, especially because we have like a, a coach who is like a very big figure, I would say. And uh, yeah, so they, they usually listen. Okay. okay cool um and i guess like as far as that goes um do you think that there's anything in particular that you guys do at bleed that has helped you build like a successful team culture where it's like everybody is willing to learn and, and super open to that kind of stuff previously i would say probably not but with this roster uh the biggest asset or the key, the key, something that we have is that everyone is like willing and open to try new things mm -hmm. new comps new agents anything so i would say that you know that that actually really helps like as long as the players are like willing to open and try anything anything works okay that makes sense um all right so let's talk about player specific stuff obviously you you look at the stuff specifically for your team but i also know that you really like just kind of like benchmarking players at, at big events i know we've had a lot of conversations about like who's actually good at the game so what do you think actually makes like a great player in valorant right now what what are like the characteristics that you look for if you were scouting like the top player let's let's say that you you were given a franchise spot and you had had to actually build a team what would you look for in players to to recruit for your team so, like even before I joined Bleed, I had actually helped a few teams in EU scout for a few players, mm -hmm. and um, so it depends. Like honestly, uh, stuff has changed a lot over the past like one year. I'll tell you that I actually helped a team scout in like twenty late twenty twenty one, and they were looking for a duelist player, and uh, they just asked for like jet stats, you know, his overall duelist stats, like and all that. So I just provided them that, and and then there was another scouting I did in like March, March of 2022 this year, and I'll tell you that the landscape had changed so much. Like I was kind of like surprised. I I I tell this to my team as well, like our duelist players, that you know it was it was really interesting to me that the team that approached me asked for like the duelist stats, but for every individual agent like Neon, Jet, Yoru, Reina, specifically for everything for that particular player. Or there was like four five other players in the list. So. If I tell this to like even my duelist players that if you're not like if you are not willing to like flex, you're like hampering your own career at this point. You know, like mm -hmm. Valent has reached at this point that like I don't know we have like twenty twenty one agents. Maybe we'll have like by the end of next we'll have like twenty five twenty six agents. So if you if you're not willing to like flex or be like you know try out new things, it won't look good for you going down the line. Yeah, that makes sense. Would you say that adaptability is probably like one of the most sought after things for a, a team right now? Yeah, currently I would say 100%. Awesome. Um, do you think that there's specific agents? Because so obviously, if um, if a team is looking for a duelist, the first place that you're probably gonna look is Jet, just because it's been like such a ubiquitous, yeah. like yeah. long term data set agent. Um, yeah. How about some of the other roles? Like I assume Sova is probably there, but are there specific like agents that? that like a scout should really be paying attention to, to like determine whether a player is like putting up good stats or not? Oh, individually, like I'll tell you like this, like from our own example here, like crazy guy, we signed him, he's our IGL and uh, and the initiative so Sova player for us. So when we were rebuilding this team back in September, I, I was looking, looking for scouting for players in the APAC region specifically for like a good initiator player. And uh, I looked at multiple stats, you know, like uh, ADR, ACS and then uh, his uh, assist stats a lot, then uh, damage with the util, etc. His ability to play different agents such as Fade or different what else can he flex? Because Fade was really hot back then, it was like one mm -hmm. of the most upcoming initiators, like probably still is now. So I looked at that, and then the, and then like there's not much that you can do, like other than this for initiators looking at you know util stats or like stats with the ult, etc. But what I did do is like I divided him like uh, uh each stat, like each different eight, seven, eight metrics that I have, like when the team won those games, what was his metrics? When when the team lost, what was his metrics? Mm -hmm. uh, like different stats on the game, the averages of that, 
different multiple conditions like when the team was performing well or bad he was in two rosters previously so i checked his like even previous one when he was in big bomb in vietnam like in late 2020 like late 2020 and early 2021 and i so there's like multiple things you need to look at and i actually found out that you know his case at Nigma Galaxy was basically like he, he he was just on a bad team like mm. uh and he he was putting up like even even though he was on a bad team although with a bit of a smaller sample size he was putting up insane numbers that i can tell you that no other player in in the apac region was putting up for sure and then uh, yeah and then uh, the next phase of that is obviously not my job i basically tell it to the management or someone and then uh, so the other thing uh, I'll just like divert a bit like even before like when I scout for the teams like EU teams or anyone else after the whole process of scouting is done I sort of give a disclaimer to the team that you know these are what the numbers say he's a good but if you sign this guy and tomorrow you know he's not willing to learn he has a bad mood or not demotivated or something then it's not my problem right because right. that's not my job <laughs> yeah. so th- th- there's a second layer to this like a second phase that you know orgs who scout for players should look at, you should actually like we straight up went and talked to like crazy guy like b- why was there a drop off in his stats you know is he willing to learn and all that we had, like um, like people in our like org had conversations with him and then we signed him so i i believe that you know other than stats like when you're scouting for players the second layer also plays a very important role yeah absolutely i mean it it's really hard i i guess that is kind of an interesting question then is like do you think it's possible for the stats to also like tell a bit of a story about like team dynamic or or is that just like kind of an opaque thing that you can't really see through at the moment? I mean, I think it's possible, like maybe not in all cases, but in certain cases because uh if you know Weltis, the he was the mm-hmm. analyst at Sentinels, like uh, one of his like very first most famous posts of all time, I remember it was like uh ACS of uh it was back during stage 2 NA qualifies or something it was like acs of uh, the duelist player when the team is winning and losing and he posted for sentinels mm-hmm. and every time sentinels won tens needed to have like 260 acs or something like that mm-hmm. so that gives a very clear picture of how the team dynamics was at sentinels back then so right okay yeah that makes sense cool okay so Going back to like the the individual player scouting stuff because this this is like the, the thing that's really interesting for me just because I come from baseball which is like a very data heavy game, uh, mm-hmm. and so I, I've and I've always enjoyed playing like fantasy sports and just like looking at, at trying to evaluate players. Um, so we know that that the data set that Valorant kind of gives us at least on the surface is pretty tailored towards duelists. Would you agree with that? I agree. Like ACS is not a good stat right so so how do you um how do you go about evaluating some of the other roles that are a little bit maybe like less numbers impactful but potentially more impactful as far as like the outcome of the game so like like a smokes player for example if if you're if you're just stuck in a site anchoring and you're playing smokes and like 80 percent of your time is like helping your teammates how do you actually like find that from the data okay so this is where we like go into like me and few other analysts like very handful that i can name uh like we have a EB and have a discord for that and few few people i've worked like we devise our own stats based on all the existing data mm-hmm. so recently like three around four five months ago i came up with a metric called an uh, anchor time or a- 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 average anchor time basically so we look at like different uh like let's say you, you are you're asking about like uh controller players so usually in most of the teams particularly how the meta is shaped right now the controller players are supposed to anchor size. For example, I can tell you like Breeze, B side, 90% of the time, it's the Viper that solo holds that side. Mm-hmm. Or uh, Ascent, A side, is usually the controller player, you know, depending if you're running an Omen or an Astra, it's usually holding solo, holding that side. So uh, uh, anchor time basically tells you um, the time uh, the player, uh, the, the controller player on, on defense, this defense specific stat, by the way. So on defense that player has lived like uh times time frame of the round like it could be like for 50 seconds 51 seconds and it, it averages that across all the times uh the the opponent team has hit planted a spike on that side okay so uh, so the higher the anchor time uh is better like the better anchor player you are and then we combine this like you know we just don't look at that 
uh, we also like look at uh, combine this with cast which is kill assist survive trade so it means that you know he's doing enough damage so if you have a high anchor time plus a high cash you're a very good duelist like a benchmark for this i look at is marco from drx mm -hmm. i think he's the best anchor time uh, anchor player in the world for me mm -hmm. so okay so that makes sense um obviously you kind of have to look at a pretty big data set because i'm sure there's some rounds where it's just like the other team is just slow like they're just kind of yeah, slowly yeah, approaching yeah, the site yeah, so yeah, yeah. you'd have to look at like a pretty big data set to yeah, get yeah. fast rounds slow rounds yeah, mid rounds yeah, like that yeah, yeah okay cool um awesome that's so you're actually just like developing your own set of stats i i guess what if, if you'd speak directly to riot right now and ask for for a couple of pieces of data a couple of stats that they could track what what sort of stats would you want the game to to incorporate that would make your job easier i mean we have already tried this so uh, like while working at run it back we used to talk to riot often for feedback we even got responses a few times and i remember like one of our like developers at run it back we we have asked multiple times for riot but i don't know probably we'll get it next year hopefully soon is like non-damage assists is like what i want to like what i really want like let, let's say a breach flash or a astra pull like basically in, like if you go to hltv you can see a flash assist on their mm -hmm. website mm -hmm. so we still don't have that in valorant you know for for flash assist maybe from breach or sky or i don't know uh so if we could get like flash assist basically all non-damage assists it would be really good. Actually, we did try to develop this ourselves. Basically, if you pull data from the API, it'll tell you the assist along with the damage it has done. Mm. And then you have to kind of separate uh, out the ones that actually were just like people yeah, shooting it, versus people using yeah, utility. Yeah, so if, if basically the, it, the data says assist, but damage is zero, that means it's a non-damage assist. Mm. But the problem is it doesn't tell you which is actually a flash assist. So there's like a lot of problems. Uh, okay. Th th there are a few hiccups over there. It's not very accurate. So we avoid using it for now. But if Riot could somehow incorporate that, it would be really good. Cool. That would give a little bit more spotlight to the the support players, yeah. and maybe maybe yeah. you'd have yeah, some yeah. sort of like Sova main tens eventually yeah. come up, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. Okay, so let me ask you about um, CS a little bit. So you, okay. you've been playing a lot of CS. You've been playing um, for a long time. How, uh, how much, I guess, of your opinions about Valorant are sort of like based in CS stuff and how much new, um, new stuff have you had to kind of like learn and develop to go into a game that has, you know, agents and heroes versus just kind of like the, the standard tech shooter? And, and what's that transition been like for you? So I'm pretty close to a few people at HLTV. Like I can tell you, like there's this guy called Nero. He mm -hmm. writes all, all all their analytical content. So I frequently like talk to him, like you know stuff that we can probably incorporate into Valorant. And then even he like takes feedback from me about Valorant that he could like you know talk about CS. So I'll tell you that about actually getting the data stuff, it's much much easier in Valorant. Like hundred times easier. You know even he tells me that you know the stuff that you get the kind of data you have i could actually dream i usually dream of all that so so getting the data is actually much easier and simpler in valorant it's readily available but the problem with uh, the next phase of that is like processing data is like a lot of problems like i told you that you know uh, like in cs basically if he writes an article about like certain thing that will probably hold true for the next three four years like at the minimum three four years but in valorant like since the meta changes so fast as new agents you frequently have to keep updating the data so uh, the data or the you know the averages are never constant in Valorant. that's that's the thing i'll say that you know mm -hmm. you need to like keep checking the averages every like um, two three months or something be it like map win rates or agent comps or something like even post plant win rates can change based on like what the current meta of like agent comps is on a particular map Right, yeah, if, if teams are starting to play more stall stuff and, and yeah. post-plant Molly lineup, that kind of, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's, that's interesting. Um, is there anything from from the CS world that you kind of wish that we could bring to Valorant in terms of, like, analytics? Because I, I was never, like, a big CS follower, but I have watched, you know, quite a few big tournaments at this point. And I, I feel like sort of their at least with like their mini map overview and stuff like that 
that there is like a lot of like readily available information yeah. that we don't necessarily have in the Valorant broadcast sometimes. Yeah, uh, specifically talking about the UI. So I'll tell you like uh, because of this uh, open CV stuff, right? That that we're doing. So uh, when we run the open CV program for official wards, uh, it's sorry, much much easier. I'm gonna stop you for a sec because we were talking about this before we actually started recording. So explain the open CV stuff uh, briefly before uh, okay. you get into that. Okay, o open CV is basically just uh, it's it stands for like uh, uh, like it's it's open source software. That's why it's open. And CV stands for computer vision. So it basically is like um, you can write programs through it. Like the current, uh, the the one that we actually use is like Google Vision. It basically uh, it's a image processing software. Like it, it reads stuff on uh, on your screen based on the how well you train the model, uh, the machine learning model. Like uh, st stuff on the screen, it could be like a still image or a video. Uh, you can find multiple projects of this online. Uh, like one of my pro early projects that I did in the university was just like recognizing how many fingers like the computer would read so we have an advanced version of this that me and a friend from brazil we're basically developing for valorant it's pretty basic right now but yeah uh coming to like this uh, official stuff you'll basically get an idea once i like finish saying what i'm about to say is like uh when we like uh run the software or the program for like um official wards it's much easier because of the ui mm. now let's say uh, you want to track ul uh, ultimates okay like like let's say we have a match against Paper Rex tomorrow, and one of the maps that will particularly play is Haven. So, uh, if you have noticed the official Valorant UI, you can see it has the alt counter, right? Like which agent has which alts. The it has these dots on the left side. Mm -hmm. So, uh, basically, the official uh, games have the the H the hood HUD basically has a lot of stuff, a lot of information. So, it's much easier for the model to read them because stuff is already there on your screen. But when we do the same thing for scrims, it's much harder because scrim is just your normal ranked game. There's nothing other than the scoreboard on top, which says, you know, the agents that you're running and right. uh, the score that the score that's on the particular round right now. So it's much harder to like record the screen. But because uh, CS has the the recorder thing, uh, the, the the demos basically, mm -hmm. you can see the stuff over and over again and how many times you want. It's much the UI is much more detailed. So if Valorant ever has uh, the recording software, I wish that you know they incorporate all that like detailed stuff, like you know who's who has which gun. It's shown on the screen all the time. Which agent has like how many? You know which agent is how many points away from the alt? It should be shown all the time. So stuff like this is like much more detailed in CS, which I wish we had in Valorant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I know this even as because uh, I've been I've been doing some coaching uh, for for a free agent team in North America and just like when you're i mean when you're in the coach slot like you're the op the observer options that you have are like nothing essentially it's, yeah, it's yeah, just like yeah, player yeah, povs yeah. it'd yeah. be really nice to be able to like you know yeah. obviously you can tab in to look at money and stuff like that but i feel like there's there could be so many more tools and i know that like overwatch had like this crazy like yeah, like yeah, yeah. coach suite Absolutely. that was like specifically yeah. for coaches to, to look at yeah. the games which is pretty cool um yeah, hopefully. The, uh, the simplest solution I can tell you is just like, for example, you know, Tracker GG, right? Mm -hmm. So Tracker GG has your rank match data, but it's so much detail, but they have the API, Valorant API access. So the simplest solution, even if they don't want to like give out the VOD or, you know, don't want to update it, they don't want teams looking at VODs, is just that, you know, when you when you run, when you scrim, right, you have these, you have to select this particular option that the match doesn't show up on the... Um, on, on the uh, on the match list the your history basically mm -hmm. the scrims don't show up so they can just make it a way so that we can see the ward uh, or see a pull data from the specified matches but you cannot even do that in valorant right now so even if you, we can't see the ward if there's a way we can actually see uh or pull data from these hidden matches just like how tracker gg does for ranked matches i think even that would be like very helpful yeah, totally. I mean, <laughs> yeah, like part of my job as as a coach is literally just to like stream every single scrim to an unlisted YouTube channel just so I can like rewatch it later. So I have like information to look at. <laughs> like uh, one, a funny example I can give you is like we had to like literally brainstorm for like two days to like how do we make the model recognize whether we are in a post plant or not me and the other brazilian guy my intern who, who i'm working with uh, we had to like brains brainstorm for like a whole day and then we finally figured out like when you plant the spike 
the spike thing t- starts blinking red on uh, in between the scoreboard. Right. So we made the model read that. So it took us like a good like seven eight hours to figure that out. Like you know how do we go about this to like record post plans automatically. Right. So th- that actually took us a long while. That makes sense. I mean, that's a great solution. Uh, that's yeah. kind of where my brain went immediately. So just in case anybody's not really fully understanding what the CV stuff is, you're basically have like, you have like machine eyes that you're training to like recognize things on the screen, essentially. And just like, it, it yeah. creates like the, the computer, it gives the computer like a set of eyes to essentially like look at the, the kill feed and see like, you're recognizing probably icons. Is that, is that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So like the yeah. jet icon and then like, I assume probably you could, see the weapon or like the headshot versus not and stuff like that. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. Interesting. The, the easiest, the, the, the easiest thing that we do is like, uh, one of the things that we look at is like true first skills. It's very easy, uh, to look at true first skills. So, uh, like if you're not familiar, true first skills is basically untreated first skills. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's basically the first skill that you get, uh, like your duelist gets when he's entering on site on attack and then he does not get traded. Basically you get the whole site. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so once you have uh, the, the thing is very easy, uh, it's much easier to record true first skills uh, through the VOD because uh, it's it, it just reads the the software just reads the kill feed. So the first kill and if it, and if the player is not traded for the like three seconds, we have set three seconds as the benchmark. Mm-hmm. So if he's if he's if he's not if he doesn't die in the next three seconds after the first kills, it's it's one true first kill. OK, yeah, that makes sense. And obviously that's super yeah. important because there's a huge difference between getting in getting a kill and then being able to take another fight versus getting in getting a kill and instantly yeah. dying yeah. right because that's yeah. that's yeah. not even really an advantage for you it's just yeah. a direct yeah. Yeah. yeah it's it's just it's just a straight you could lose that round from that point of on you i mean you don't have a specific advantage mm-hmm. okay um all right let's let's uh let's talk a little bit about that that that's an interesting spot for me so you obviously spend a lot of time looking at these sort of like advantage and disadvantage situations. That, that seems to be one of the main things that you're focusing on a lot of the time. What yeah. is, um, wh- I guess, what were, what are like a couple common scenarios where it's like really, really important to understand whether you're uh, successful in them or not? So it's like, if you're looking, do you think that like 4v5 win rate is like, way more important than i don't know like first bloods or 3v5 win rays or like does that question make sense yeah uh like i can kind of answer this question is like uh first of all i mean both are important but 5v4 is like so since i do all this i have the general average on my head so the the uh, average right now in vct the 5v4 conversion rate is like 82 percent okay and the average for a 4v5 conversion is 29.5%. Okay. Okay. So so, uh, for 5v4 conversion, obviously you need to be hitting numbers above this. Like probably like, like, let's say DRX, they have like 91% conversion rate. So you probably should be around the 90% mark. That means you're a good team, a really good team. Uh, That's the 5v4 part. But the other one, the 4v5, like since 2.29.5 is the benchmark. But let's say uh, your average is like 34%. It means you're a good team, but then since you're so high above uh, because you're in disadvantage situation, it means like you're actually a very, very good team. There's mm. like, that one actually holds a bit more weight compared to like a 5v4. I okay. mean, both of them hold, hold hold like equal weight, but if you have a very high like 4v5 conversion, it means that like you're pretty good. Mm-hmm. That makes sense because you're actually overcoming like a greater obstacle with yeah, the, the yeah, 4v5. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah cool. Yeah. Um, if I could pick your raid for a couple of the stats, do you do you remember anything about like what uh the average like post plant conversion rate is or the def- uh retake conversion or anything like that? Uh, it's vaguely on my head. The retake one, is, yeah, the retake one is around. Uh, so it's map specific, but mm-hmm. I don't remember max map specific. But like overall, like all seven maps average is uh the retake one is around like um to, uh, this is the fair retake basically like uh, for all fair retake scenarios basically 4v4 5v5 3v3 mm-hmm. i i don't include 1v1s like whenever sure. i do this because 1v1s are like very iffy and 50 50 so i just avoid them so it's basically for 2v2s the average is around 30 31 percent okay and uh for like 
wait, th- this is for retake basically. I don't remember the other one right now. Okay, that, that's fine. So yeah. interesting. So 30, 31% for fair retake. So just yeah. getting the spike down is like a 70% win rate. Yeah. Like yeah. advantage. That's yeah. crazy. Uh, 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 the, the numbers vary from map to map and side to side. Sure. But this, this is the average overall, I remember. Okay, interesting. Um, do you have a, a specific map that you like looking at the most? Do you have a favorite map in the game to, to analyze? My favorite maps would probably be like uh, Breeze and Split. But Split is gone, but it's coming back now. Yeah, so I like, I, I mean, I like that map. The reason why I like uh, analyzing these two maps a lot is because these two maps have like a very heavy, um, like these are very heavy one-sided maps. Like if you remember, Split had a win rate of 56% on defense, mm-hmm. which is like st- still on record even though split is gone no map has ever peaked at that much of a defensive side win rate ever mm-hmm. and the, uh, the story goes similar for breeze which has a very high attack side win rate of around 50 50 56 57 something around that so these two maps are like kind of the anomaly so i really like uh, looking at uh, these two maps because uh like obviously it's not good uh, an ideal map should always be balanced but since these maps are like anomalies and favor such side like like one side particularly very heavily there's like a lot of things you can actually do you know like i mean i can't reveal some of the stuff that sure, we do sure. but, the, but but there's like a lot of stuff that you can do to like f- heavily favor you you know okay yeah that makes sense um okay cool free split yeah thank god splits coming back that's definitely yeah. Yeah. definitely sorely missed in uh in the professional scene in my opinion yeah. Yeah. um Okay, let me ask you a bit about the meta. Um, just because you mentioned the game is constantly changing. Uh, that's one of the main differences between it and, and Counter-Strike is that there's just sort of like a never-ending shift. Um, and I, I also come from Dota 2 where the meta was like a never-ending cycle. Um, and I assume we'll, we'll probably start to see that in Valorant a bit where it's like as, as buffs come into certain characters, they get played more. Uh, then they probably get nerfed because they're getting played too much. And then the characters that were pushed out of the meta by certain agents being integrated into it will kind of come back into uh, like power, I guess, in terms of, of their yeah. spot in the meta. Yeah. Like we're, we're going to see that now with very, very likely as Chamber sort of gets pushed out by the nerfs because mm-hmm. uh, he's definitely way worse than he was before. Yeah. Like, Jet's uh, definitely going to come back. Yeah, yeah. Funny enough, like we had we had scrims today, mm-hmm. and uh, like we ran him like first scrim of the day, we ran him for one map, and uh, like instantly we realized like this is not gonna work. Like it's unplayable. <laughs> yeah, it's done. Yeah, everything from the, the trip range to the the yeah. types of of fights you can do with the teleport it's so different. And I assume that immediately you guys were probably like, well, I guess we're probably gonna play Jet for the op agent at this point, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. Um, okay, so as far as agents go, what agent, I mean, Chamber's a pretty obvious pick here, but I guess what agents would you say have been the most impactful in the meta as far as like okay. changing how the game is played? And does the data reflect that? Okay, I can tell you something that the data probably will not reflect, at least uh, in one way, is uh, that uh, recently I was looking at the most played a- agents on a particular map. And uh, if you look at individually, uh, like overall pick rates, you'll probably never see uh, Kayo like uh, up there. You know, he'll never have a pick rate above above, like 50 percent. He's probably like 30, around the 30, 35 mark. Mm -hmm. But then funnily enough, like oddly, if you if you go if you go to run it back and if you look at like um, most played agents for like every map, like most sorry, most popular comps for every map, you'll see that out of the seven maps, Kayo is like four of them. Mm -hmm. So. If you look at just raw numbers for Asian pick rates, you'll probably not see KO up there. But if you see his uh, like pi- pi- like p- popularity among different comps, like most popular comps, he's played on four out of five maps. So no one, I, I don't feel like people like talk much about KO, but I feel like slowly but steadily he's been like a very staple agent, and he'll continue to become more and more staple. I feel. Yeah, I mean, I in my opinion, I I think that he's probably the best agent in the game. Just like yeah. as far as like th- what he can bring to a team, yeah. Um, yeah. How about the the different metas that we've had, like the the Viper Astra meta? Obviously, was there's a lot of complaints about it because it was like, oh, the balance so slow. 
do you think that that was uh an agent problem where like we didn't have the tools yet there weren't agents to beat that yet or do you think it was just like these two agents when played together at the time were just too strong uh by themselves okay so about this i can tell you that i in it, before when i started right uh, articles were running back like like early back in like early this year like 2021 late 2020 uh, I, I used to like pick. I used to look at pick rates individually, like you know, Sentinel pick rate and then Controller pick rate and Jet pick rate and I mean, sorry, Duelist pick rate and all that. <laughs> jet pick rate is <laughs> the same think, as Duelist yeah, pick rate, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, like I remember, like very vaguely, like start start of the year, the first thing that sort of balanced out was, uh, I think the Controller pick. There was no Harbor back then. Mm. It, it it was it was the Controller pick rate. I remember, like at least like around Feb. All the controller agents were like sort of balanced, you know. Mm -hmm. Each one of them had like uh, 20, 20, like all four had like 20, 25, 30, 34. Like it was kind of balanced. Like every d controller agent had some use on some map. Then uh, I remember like uh, once Fade came in, the initiators sort of like balanced out. Mm -hmm. Each one of them had some use on every map. Uh, the only one that sort of didn't balance out was Sentinel. Uh, because obviously Chamber came in and everyone was playing Chamber, and then if, even the duelist, the duelist thing I remember early early year it was not balanced at all because of it, it was because of um, first of all it was because of Jet he was like too overpicked, and the other reason was because Phoenix and Yoru were basically useless back mm -hmm. then. So because of the Chamber thing, because everyone started picking Chamber and Jet's pick rate sort of dropped. The duelist sort of like balanced, you know, and even Yoru sort of came back into the meta. So the duelist sort of like balanced. Each one of them had like some use, some like good chunk of pick rates overall. The only problem was like Sentinels. But uh, because of these changes to Chamber, I initially thought that maybe even the Sentinels would balance out. But like they have made Chamber like completely useless. So I, I think like I don't even know if Chamber is a Sentinel right now. Like what is he? He yeah. has like one trademark. Yeah, he's in, he's in a weird spot right now. Yeah. Um, and also one one thing that I was talking with somebody else about was that when Chamber came into the meta, because he was like the de facto op agent, um, it kind of allowed you to play other duelists. Whereas now, if you want to use the operator, you're probably going to default to using Jet, which means yeah. you're you're very likely only going to have a Jet on your team because double duelist just kind of seems like not really a thing i mean unless you're like kind of a crazy team that can figure out some way to to utilize it it just seems like the the agent role stuff is maybe the least balanced part of the game right now where it's like if you have a wall hacking scan you have so much more of an advantage over a team that's running you know two flashers or, or two yeah, two yeah. people that can like run in and heal themselves or something like that yeah 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 um but uh, e e even even uh not only that but it's i mean it would be f for chamber like i initially like at this point after like our scrims today like he, he was like really really bad i just felt that you know at least now they could probably just give him the second trademark mm -hmm. like it wouldn't make much of a difference but maybe he might be a bit more playable like if he has two trademarks yeah, he he's definitely in a really weird spot right now. He's he's like, I don't know, <laughs> like like just just going back, just looking at like what a sentinel is. Like it gathers info, like especially right. on defense, watching flanks. If you look at every other sentinel, like okay, except Sage, but even Sage has two slows. But if you look at others, like Cipher has two tripwires. Mm. Uh, Killjoy has a has a alarm board and a t turret. Chamber has one trademark that you have to like beyond range whose whose circle like uh, that the slow is reduced like he, this i don't know like what are the, it's very weird like where chamber is right now yeah i mean i'm not i'm not sad to see him not played but at the same time i i do have a bit of a worry that we are just going to kind of like you know i was talking about the cyclical nature of the meta i would not be surprised if we just go back to like jet plus you know sova plus ko yeah. plus killjoy yeah. on like 80 percent of the maps and yeah. then at that point it's like where do we go from there does it become people go to astro viper to counter like these explosive hits with jet where it's the jet just gets separated and killed every single time they execute which is kind of what happened 
yeah, as like the next phase of the meta when Astro and Viper are super strong. Um, I guess where do you where do you see the meta going from here? And, and do you think it's like in a good place, or do you think there needs to be like some significant work done to make the game more balanced? I mean, there will be certain agents that will probably take a hit. Uh, the meta might become stale for a while. I feel so. Because one agent that is not being talked about, but I feel will see a drop off, is like in controllers is Omen, not mm. because he uh, he got a nerf or a buff, but at least for for at least in our team, if you look at or many other teams or multiple maps, that at the at least like before these patches came out, like you know you could run either Astra or Omen. Mm. It didn't really make much of a difference, honestly. You know, it just depend. It just it it just depended on your play style, basically what kind of play style you want to play, and you could either run either of those. It didn't honestly didn't make much of a difference. But it didn't make much of a difference because the the game was going in such a manner that you know you had chamber. Uh, teams usually played much slower. You know, Omen's one way smokes had like so much use that you know uh, if, if a team is usually playing slow, his one way smokes could in stop you. He had a paranoia. You know, his smokes recharged much faster. But now that the teams will go back to playing duelist, you know, I feel the tempo of the game will increase once again Mm -hmm. with like the solo duelist or a double duelist or whatever people play. And because of that, Astra will see much more value Mm -hmm. because of a pull or everything on defense. You can stop the opponents. You can smoke. You can do the same one-way smokes, but you can stop uh, like the pull or stun. So I feel that, you know, Omen might see a drop off in his pick rate because of that. Interesting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, just, yeah, I mean, if, if everybody's playing Jet, then everybody has the ability to kind of, like, break a site open very, very quickly, whereas yeah. with Chamber, yeah. it was more so, like, contacting in and trying to, like, yeah. maneuver people across the map. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. I want to totally change up topics for a second. Um, I want to talk about IGLs because I feel I feel like this is one of the maybe least understood aspects of the game and people know like obviously the IGL is supposed to be the one who's kind of like calling the strats and stuff like that but what would you say is is like the true importance of an IGL like how how much of the team's success depends on the on the IGL and and is that possible to show with with data it's really hard to show that with data to be honest like for example i told you about our sc- scouting when we were scouting for crazy guy one of our players I told you, like, he was one of the best initiator players in the team. And the other thing was, he can IGL. He IGL'd on his previous team. So that, you know, someone who's putting up that much numbers but can IGL, that was basically a, like a like a golden bonus for us. Like, mm. uh, it, it was incredible that, you know, he was putting up those numbers while IGLing on a pretty rough team back then as well. So, uh, but that's not always the case, right? You don't always, like, get so lucky every time. Uh, so... It's really hard to gauge IGLs. So I told you about like the second phase of scouting where you actually talk to the players. I feel like that is like much more key when you're like looking for IGLs. Like, you know, talk to talk to the player directly or like, you know, talk to his teammates or like people who have played with him. Like what kind of IGL is he? And obviously the numbers also play a part. You know, you can't have an IGL who's like always bottom fragging or something like that. So numbers also help, but like, just to gauge like how good of IGL is, it's one thing that will tell you that probably stats will probably not do justice to like mm-hmm. you know an IGL. You cannot. That makes sense. Um, yeah. As far as scouting goes, what um, what do you think the scene, or I guess where do you think the scene will go? Do you think that scouting is going to become like a bigger and bigger part of esports, like like it is in in traditional sports. Obviously, there's like a huge amount of like developmental, uh, yeah. you know, there's developmental leagues and people are getting scouted out of high school. Like there's there's a ton of this stuff. Do you think that that is going to come to esports? Do you think that that needs to come to esports? Uh, yeah, I mean, you talked about baseball. One of my favorite movie of like one of my favorite movie all time is Moneyball, and like I... it talks about like sc- scouting so well. So um, scouting, I think, is like really important. Like even right now, when I look at many of the franchise teams, uh, some of them, the kind of players just signed, it doesn't like really make sense to me. Like even some of the franchise teams in our APAC region, it's like I don't know what the hell they were thinking. Like when they signed <laughs> some of these players, so. Uh, I think scouting name will be really names. important. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I, mean, I, I mean, I don't want to. I, I don't want to name some. But then, 
but then like I, 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 about the scouting part I think scouting will get a bit more easier because of the game mode that's coming uh, Premier Alpha I think that's what it's called mm-hmm. from next year where you can see people like it's basically like a FPL system in CS where we have you can see like the top 500 players uh, every act or something like uh, I don't know I, I'm not sure what what the exact criteria is like someone told me that you have to be like radiant first to like get into like Premier Alpha or something mm-hmm. so I think uh, in CS it's like uh, like especially in the CIS region where like a lot of talent come from like you can look at Navi's academy team in CS like they pick like <laughs> they honestly pick diamonds like Monacy then there's a guy called head trick right now I think that's what he's called like they scout some of the most insane players in the region and I, I talk to like many of these people from this region and they tell me that uh, you know FPL plays a big role like you frequently see these players pop up in the FPL board and then that's how you scout for players so I think because of Premier Alpha coming in, scouting will be a bit more easier next year. Interesting. That makes sense. Um, and, and yeah, the scouting stuff is really interesting because you can definitely see teams that seem to have good scouts. Like I, Fnatic is a great example. Is that they keep yeah. coming up with like, okay, where did Durka come from? Oh, yeah. okay, where did Alfier come from? You know, they just keep yeah. bringing up I these mean, players. I mean, even if you go to my latest tweet right now, it's on my timeline, it's, it's about North Epson. Mm-hmm. They have broken their team two times when they had Seoldam. Mm-hmm. Insane team. I don't know from where he came from. The, that team got, like, that team fell apart. They sold the team. They signed this team with Meteor, Zenfri, and all those guys. Another insane team. They make it to Masters. That team fell apart again. Some of the players got sold to franchise teams. Now, again, honestly, in my opinion, they have signed some insane players. Like, mm-hmm. no, like I don't know why, but I was helping some of the team scout, and none of the, no, none of the players were looking at Muthi. He's like one of the best free agent players in Korea right now. They signed him. Mm-hmm. So I think at least in our region, in Asia, I think uh, North Epson is like a very good benchmark, like a team with like very good scouting. Interesting. And it, it's not like they always pay like big bucks to sign high profile players. It's right. like they just have, they just have like really good scouting. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of like the whole money ball approach, right? Is, is you're yeah. looking for stuff that people are maybe overlooking because it, there's no like big name necessarily, or that maybe they don't even have a proven track record, but there is like something you can see that's like out of the ordinary in a good yeah. way about, about a player. So that's cool. Yeah. Uh, that's, I, I, I hadn't really thought of North Epson because usually when I think of scouting, I think about basically like uh fanatic, I think about... Um, in I North- mean, yeah, yeah, in NA, I think the best example, probably, you know, some of the signings, some people will disagree, but I'll say 100 Thieves. 100 Very thieves. good scouting. Yeah, 100 yeah. Thieves, good scouting. Maybe like the guard would be up yeah, there. Even, yeah, sorry, yeah, even the guard, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that, especially as the Franchise League continues to develop, I would imagine that that's going to become like a more and more important part of it because anytime you look at like a traditional sports league with scouting... Or, or with with just like players there's always just a lot of churn right you know players are good for a couple of years maybe they do really well and then somebody else wants them on their team and they get signed and the the org just like doesn't want to pay them an insane amount of money to keep them on their team and so then they have to find a new player to replace them and the teams that have that good scouting that are able to replace these players can actually like really kind of take a step forward because they can not only like make money from selling players that are maybe like trending slightly downward, but they're constantly bringing in new talent that's trending upwards to replace them. Yeah. Yeah. In football, uh, in like soccer, in football, we have uh, the concept of like uh, feeder clubs or seller clubs. Mm -hmm. Like uh, if you can look at Ajax or Benfica, these are like uh, smaller clubs. Like Ajax is a club in uh, Amsterdam, Ajax Amsterdam from Netherlands. They have like the best academy in the uh, world, in my opinion. They they sign like they make players at, when when they turn like 18, 20, they sell it to like PSG or like bigger clubs like Manchester United for like 100, 200 millions. Like mm-hmm. Ajax is like one of the biggest examples of like a feeder club I can give you. But they have insane scouting as well. Like this, they have scouts like all over South America and Asia and even Africa. They they come off with they they like if every two three years after they sell. Literally, their whole squad, they're back in the Champions League with a, with a new team. Gotcha. But that's not just the scouting, though. That also says that they have very, very good, like, talent development on their yeah, on yeah. their staff, right? Which yeah. is kind of the second yeah. part of that. Obviously, you can find somebody who looks insane by the numbers, but if you don't have the ability to kind of, like, polish that yeah. diamond in the rough, I guess, to use the cliche, 
um, you're not going to get the same value out of out of being a good scout. So um, I guess in that vein, uh, as far as like support staff goes and and developing talent, um, do you have any insight into into that? Like how how important is is the the talent development and like do you have any specific like advice for people that are trying to help develop talent in in esports so i mean it's something that we're trying to do like i can give you an example is like we previously had an academy team and we had a player called juicy mm-hmm. he 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 is on the main team right now he he hit apac radiant at the age of 13 so wow. he 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 was always like very very talented he's on our main team right now so this is where like the second phase of that development comes in like it's our goal as support staff to like he has all the insane mechanics you know like we have to like somehow make him consistent and translate and we develop him in such a way that he becomes a player who's like he's meant to be mm-hmm. for the for the talent that he has for the skills that he has so that's where like the support staff comes in and it's very important the support staff plays a very good role because we have to actually like you know translate his raw mechanical skill or the skills that he shows on ranked or everywhere into like an actual team so that he can play with the team uh, communication is another factor you know just because he has insane skills he we have to like so when a player is young as like 16 or 17 we have to like teach them everything so the support staff is very key you know if you have a good support staff things his life becomes much easier you know mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, mechanics, I, I keep saying this about this game where, like, if you're good enough to be on a team, even at, like, the Tier 2 level, even, like, a free agent pug team, for the most part, mechanics are, like, not going to be the limiting factor. It, it's yeah. almost 100% going to be your communication, your ability to work with teammates, and, like, your ability to kind of, like, read the game and then anticipate what's happening and adapt to it, so... How do you even go about developing some of those skills? Like in in your example, with a super young player who is mechanically super talented, like how do you how do you help them become a better communicator and like a better teammate overall? And maybe that's it's not a, necessarily like your area of expertise as a data analyst, but I, I'm sure that you see it happening and and probably yeah. play some role. Yeah, so it's like a step by step process. Honestly, I'll say it takes it, you. You have to be patient, like with like these kind of prodigy players. Honestly, it takes a long while for them to like get like up 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 sp- up to speed with like the whole fundamental dynamics how how a team works. Mm-hmm. So like pa- patience is obviously like very important. Patience from your side and patience from his side as well. So the first step is probably communication. How how the team works. How 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 what is your exact role on the team? Like. Not every prodigy is a duelist. Like he, like for example, uh, on loud less mm-hmm. he plays uh, uh, he plays sentinels, but he's like insane. He's only sixteen. The so and he he won he won the he won champions with uh, loud. So like I'm pretty sure loud are also doing doing the right thing with him. So it it's honestly like it's hard for me to say, but it's like a step by step process and with a lot of patience and like. Uh, I talk to like other like our coaches like as well as support staff our other assistant coach as well Godspeed and uh, we go about like uh, like how he does is basically we have like a step st- step by step basic benchmark from like beat stats or whatever so there's like uh, in like 3 weeks of progress he should hit certain metrics of like let's say opening kill percentage or something compared to like x player mm. then we slowly in- increase that and uh, we keep going that way. So th- this was just an example I gave you of like opening kill percentage from him because he plays duelist on our team. So it's like a step-by-step process, you know? You need to like keep raising the bar eventually like so we can harness all his skills. Mm-hmm. And I guess probably that's one area where having like a good understanding of the data and the metrics behind stuff is really useful because you can actually set like achievable goals i think that's one of the the hardest things about getting better is if you don't see like where the finish line is it can be very hard to actually like figure out where you're going right yeah yeah it shouldn't also be like you you set set something astronomical you know like you should hit some ridiculous ea level numbers but that's not going to happen in like one month right so it it, it's a step-by-step process cool yeah that that makes a lot of sense i mean yeah just the 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 idea of these sort of like small achievable goals is is something that people always preach as far as getting better. But I guess with with numbers, it becomes so much easier to actually like point to things that that people need yeah. to be doing. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um. I guess 
I just want to ask you one one last question uh, before I let you go. I, I don't want you to stay up all night over there in Singapore. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, as far as team dynamics, I, I think one of the, the most important things in esports is being able to handle like losing and conflict. Um, so how, how, do you, how do you guys help the players handle that? Because obviously even the best players in the world are going to lose and are going to go through hard times. So is there anything that you do in particular to help players deal with like the struggle of, of getting better? I mean, we have, we, we have lost a fair share of games. Like we have come really, really close to qualifying to, for masters and champions every time. And we have lost. So, I mean, it's hard. Like even uh, honestly, me as genuinely, I, I live on adrenaline and like I myself, like, you know, so it's it, honestly it's hard but sometimes you just have to take it but uh as time it, it it's a bit different you know because uh some of the players who are like really young it's hard for them because we just lost a game they they start thinking about multiple different things so it's important that you know we we look at things that we did good and we improve on the things that we did bad and uh, once you lose it's it's a mental reset from there you know we base how we basically do is like uh we have like a sort of team discussion about what we did wrong mm -hmm. what we plan to do ahead and then we basically don't do much for the next like two three days obviously if it's a big loss if it's just one game like a tournament we lost a game with a low bracket we just brush it off and we just keep going mm -hmm. but if it's like a tournament loss we're knocked out we particularly don't do anything for the like next one or two days it's basically a time frame we need everyone needs that for like a mental reset and then we communicate once again have team discussions and you know so that it doesn't affect the team we especially talk to the younger players or players who cannot handle the loss in such a way how they're doing we basically like tell them that you know th th we, we were bad we, res we respect the opponent the opponent played be better that day uh we played bad like uh, we, we look at this st not just stats but uh even like uh human error you know it could be because of lack of communication or anything so we discuss all this so i i mean these are all like the how, how you cope with it but uh the most important thing is like uh, a mental reset probably is the best thing mm -hmm. to like uh, avoid thinking about the negative stuff don't look at social media like i mean after you lose social media is probably the most horrible place <laughs> yeah. especially the especially the vlr forums you know <laughs> yeah so that's that's one place like i tell them you should never be looking at mm -hmm. cool that makes sense yeah, I mean, losing, I guess it's like an old saying, but losing just never gets easy. It's yeah, yeah. it's never yeah. going to feel good, and it's always something you're yeah. going to have to deal with if you're a competitor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, Ominous. Well, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, before, sure. before I let you go, what um, do you have anything spe special coming up in, in 2023? Like, and, and where can people find you if they want to read uh, some of your articles and see your stats and stuff like that? I mean, I'm always on Twitter posting stuff, articles, uh, especially like during the off season, I, I have been writing much. I'm basically just like one or two articles for running back like every month, but like probably like in the off season, I write more. I also write most like on my medium blog. I, I'm planning on like updating it. So that's all that. And uh, something like for you, I can say is that I know you're pretty much into Dota. So Bleed is signing a Dota 2 roster. So uh, I hope you support us as well for that. Heck yeah. Um, yeah, I'm excited yeah. to see what you guys do so, in yeah, Dota. Yeah. I mean, you can see our latest announcement. Uh, we signed Forev, uh, the Korean guy, as as the coach. Yeah. So hopefully it's a good one. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, keep uh, keep supporting us. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. very excited to see what you guys do in Valorant and and Dota in the upcoming year. Yeah. All right. Thank you again yeah. for your time, and yeah. uh, we'll uh, we'll see good things from Bleed yeah. and from yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. It was a pleasure talking. Thank you.